Have you ever heard a piece of music and wished it was longer? Ever heard part of a soundtrack during a movie and wanted to listen to the full thing? Well, apparently so did film director Sergio Leone. When he directed A Fistful of Dollars, the first of three movies starring Clint Eastwood as the man with no name, Leone didn't have the score until after the film had been shot. He still worked directly with composer Ennio Morricone in crafting the movie's sound, but as is fairly common in making a movie, it was once he had entered the editing room. By the time Leone made the third movie, The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, Morricone was so involved in the process that he had composed some pieces before filming even began, meaning Leone likely had them in his mind while he was filming some sequences, and certainly when he was editing them. To put it one way then, as Leone biographer Sir Christopher Frayling once did, what we're watching, in the summer of 1966, is the birth of the rock video. This is especially evident in the last 20 minutes of the film. After sitting with the movie for at least 2 hours and 20 minutes, 2 hours 35 minutes in the original Italian cut, this is truly the moment the audience has been waiting for, and it's certainly the moment that Tuco, played by Eli Wallach, has been waiting for. He has just arrived at a cemetery which he believes houses the grave in which $200,000 in gold is buried. You can feel the excitement, the ecstasy, the ecstasy of gold. Appropriately then, the music creeps in, Ennio Morricone's The Ecstasy of Gold. On the piano is a four-note ostinato, simple but enchanting, as Tuca realizes where he is and begins his search. As we build curiosity, enter the oboe, strings, drums, and a single chime of the tubular bell. As Tuco's search increases to a run, so too does the music, with drums galloping along with increasing anticipation and desperation. And alongside the drums comes perhaps the song's most notable element, the beautiful soprano voice of Edda Del Orso, whose introduction prompts the camera to finally cut away after an elevating 56 second shot. The music and camera increase in intensity as Tuco's run does, before all three plateau when he reaches the centre of the cemetery. Tuco takes a second to gather his surroundings and prepare himself for the search ahead, just as the audience does the same. Then he starts running. Morricone's music really propels the viewer through this sequence, especially as its intensity increases, and accordingly the camera does the same, moving in line with the music. Unlike elsewhere in the film, this scene doesn't have a whole lot of cuts because this isn't really meant to be intense as such, it's more about excitement and ecstasy, so the camera does most of the work instead, alongside the music. It's truly exciting and uplifting, and it has, according to Morricone, a circular flavour. It's a charming scene and a charming piece of music. Frailing certainly seems to think so, identifying the two recurring trumpet sounds as the ghosts of the graveyard mocking Tuco's desperate search. As for why this scene is so strangely uplifting considering its protagonist, well I think film historian Tim Lucas put it best. We both hate Tuco and are charmed by him. We can now feel in his bones that everything that he has suffered in his life is about to be paid for, grandly, here, on this day. And because we've all suffered, we've all dreamed, we cannot help but see ourselves in him. Our hearts bolt high as his run becomes a prance, the prance of a devil perhaps. And as the scene maddens with anticipation, we actually want him to win. And the scene just keeps going. A lot of other directors would have done less running around, cut the scene short, but Leone truly set his own pace and let the music guide him in doing so. It increases in tempo with the speed of the montage, continuing to rise through several octaves until graves blur past. There are gorgeous shots of the camera following Tuco, keeping him in frame and in focus while the background, the ecstatic shots of the graves, remains blurred. It's genuinely stunning, and the method by which these shots were captured, by putting several cameras on the ends of a pole on a tripod and turning them together, is appropriately creative. The way the music continues to build, quantitatively rather than dynamically, adds anticipation to the sequence, and as Tuco's anticipation increases, so too does the viewers. Reaching a fever pitch as the bells go crazy, the instrumentation gets so loud, it almost becomes unbearable. Then inevitably, everything, the camera, Tuco and the music, stops dead in its tracks. The grave has been found. This is a scene that demands the viewer's full attention and participation. Every audio and visual element is utilised to perfection. To steal another quote from Tim Lucas, it's really not an exaggeration to say that this sequence took an entire generation of moviegoers, ripped them wide open, and changed them for the rest of their lives. They went to the movies expecting a big adventure, not to be taught so much about operatic beauty. 
It's no wonder this song is not only one of Morricone's most famous themes, but one of the most iconic and beloved tracks in cinematic history. It's one of my favourite sequences of any movie, yet bizarrely, it's not even the climax. After this, there are still more than 15 minutes left. Leone still has to finish the movie, and in doing so, he has to try and maintain or even increase the quality after the masterful scene he's just crafted. So as Tuco desperately searches for the money, Clint Eastwood's Blondie enters the scene, now wearing his signature poncho that we saw him wearing in the previous two movies. In the eyes of the viewer, or at least those who watched the last two films, he is elevated to almost mythical status. He is no longer just Blondie, he is the man with no name. Before long, Angel Eyes, the talented Lee Van Cleef, enters, and the grave is revealed to be empty, upon which the final showdown begins to become clearer. Here we see more of Leone's carefully considered geometry, specifically his triangular compositions. According to Christopher Frayling, this happens quite a bit in the film, three human figures giving a sense of perspective where there are no other suitably identifiable backdrops with which to do so. In this, Leone was inspired by the paintings of Edgar Degas, who similarly crafted triangulation through differing perspectives of human figures. This triangular perspective carries into the final showdown. In fact, it was written into the script this way, and if you want proof of Leone's ability to stretch out a scene to its absolute entertainment maximum, look no further than what he was working from in the script. The three in a triangle in the desolation of the cemetery. Immobile. Only the wind and the stones and the grass. A long act of tension. And what a long act of tension it is. Almost a five minute sequence, around half of which consists of the three men taking places at their points within the circle. Speaking of which, Leone's carefully considered geometry recurs in the form of this circle, a common element for Leone's finales, perhaps an echo of a motif established at the beginning of the film, in which Angel Eyes rides past a circular stone floor and a circular spinning water wheel. Robert C. Cumbo perhaps put it best. It geometrizes the relationship among the three characters and provides an arena for their reckoning. It comments ironically on the whole situation, summing up the film's cynical view of life itself. Those countless concentric circles of graves are grouped around a large nothing, a big empty circle, a zero. The only answer to the question silently asked by all these dead soldiers. Leone wanted 10,000 graves to be built for this sequence, to truly fill the screen with the depth of the horror of war. While he only got about half of that, the effect is still the same, presenting a perfect macabre arena in which to stage this final showdown. Three-way standoffs aren't really thematically or narratively easy to set up in films. There has to be an effective balance of character motivation, power, and plot dynamics. Typically, if there is a trio of leading characters, one is removed in an earlier sequence to allow the final showdown to be between the good and the bad. Even the preceding film in this trilogy, for a few dollars more, has Eastwood's character sit out of the final standoff. But this film is called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So the final showdown, naturally, has to be between all three. A triangle. And there's a reason this has become the poster child for the Mexican standoff. It establishes motivation, power, and plot dynamics effectively. We spent the last two and a half hours learning more about the characters' motivations, specifically their non-ending quest to get the gold, but also their individual motivations. Blondie's moral high ground and intelligence, Tuco's desperation, greed, and survival, and Angel Eyes's cold ruthlessness and greed. This also demonstrates each character's power and their ability to stop at nothing to achieve their goal, which gives an extra sense of decisiveness to the final standoff, since we know none of them will be pulling their punches, making the plot dynamics even clearer. The entire film has established this theme of greed, betrayal, and morality. A final standoff to the death is entirely narratively and thematically appropriate. Leone thought as much too. He found the sequence gave him the greatest satisfaction. He even invented a word for it, triello, a play on the traditional duello, meaning duel. He considered this a sort of ballet, a dance of death, perhaps like the paintings of Degas. And like any good ballet, it has a piece of music to accompany it. This one appropriately titled The Trio by Ennio Morricone, once described as a five minute bolero of death. It begins subdued, with light woodwinds accompanying the diegetic sounds of the wind. Then as Blondie places down the rock on which he has apparently etched the name of the correct grave, the final standoff really begins, heralded by an incredibly loud riff on the flamenco guitar played by the talented Bruno Battisti Di Mario. The use of this guitar, named after and used in a Spanish dance known for its drama and intensity, 
really helps to position this sequence as a sort of dance, further illustrated in the use of castanets, which are commonly associated with dancing. It's a dance of death, in which each participant carefully selects their own position, maneuvers into it, and anticipates the movements of everyone else. Like the scene that preceded it, it's Leone and Morricone working in perfect harmony, each lifting the other's work and giving them deeper meaning. And like the previous scene, the whole thing is cut to music. From here, the song continues to build, introducing a mariachi trumpet by Francesco Catania. This style of music had begun to earn mainstream recognition in the United States around the time the film released, but not so much during its mid-19th century setting, which really shows Morricone's goal of perhaps keeping us both in the past and the present musically. Some have compared this music to a bullfight, which isn't inappropriate considering the context of its usage. Tim Lucas compared it to the Degeo, the Mexican wartime bugle call, indicating that the battle was underway, and it was to the death. Leone, meanwhile, felt the mariachi was like the laughter of the corpses inside the tombs. The music continues building, with syncopated strings and a choir atop this unmoving 36 second shot. And then, just as everybody is in place and the duel is ready to begin, the music stops. Crows caw. Men stare. And the quiet tune of a glockenspiel keeps the viewer on their toes. Because just as this showdown is a trio, so too is the series, and the music responds appropriately, referencing the mariachi trumpet from A Fistful of Dollars and the glockenspiel pocket watch theme from For A Few Dollars More. Because while the narratives may not be connected, this truly is the end of the trilogy, the final showdown. As we hear a slight reprise of the music, we also hear a disruptive electronic sound. Mimicking gunfire, perhaps, hinting at the conclusion that is to come. All throughout this sequence too, Leone gets closer to our trio, from medium long shots, commonly associated with this genre, to medium close-ups, to close-ups, of faces, hands, and guns. Perhaps inspired by the beauty of the music, or perhaps simply by his own desire to dilate time, Leone stretches out this sequence to its full intensity. In the quieter moments of this scene, the thunderous and rolling sounds of the timpani teases the return of the music to its full scale. For a full minute, we inch closer to the characters, with beautiful music to accompany it, including a gorgeous piano riff that increases in tempo, but the intensity with which the song started is still in the back of our minds, and Morricone knows it. An intense run of snare, an increase in pitch, an increase in volume, and then the return of the full orchestra, the choir, and the trumpet to take us home. And as the music gets more intense, so too does the cinematography, and so too does the editing. Close-ups become extreme close-ups. Five-second shots become two seconds, become one second, a fraction of a second, the shortest being only five frames. The editing becomes accelerated, the camera gets crazy. But in classic Leone style, none of this feels gratuitous. Every shot, every cut has a purpose. The entirety of this film, according to Leone's own admission and Frayling's expert scholarship, can be read in these extreme close-ups. Tuco, the eyes of a rat, anxious, calculating, naive. Angel eyes, the eyes of a robot, cold, collected, implacable. And Blondie, the eyes of a guardian angel, assured, intelligent, amused. Frayling believes this sequence is not related to real time, that it's time stretched, time dilated, a purely cinematic moment, and it ends in a purely cinematic way. Because it was never a triello, Blondie made sure Tuco's gun was empty, this was never meant to be a standoff between the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was simply a duel between the good and the bad, as it always is. The standoff sequence alone is certainly Leone's most influential piece of filmmaking, and perhaps even one of the most influential scenes in cinema history. From the moment the film released in the 1960s, the sequence was being taught as a textbook example of action and music. It has inspired countless directors, many of whom have paid homage directly, and some indirectly. Movie brats like Martin Scorsese, John Milius, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, plus other directors of this era and far beyond, like John Jacquinot, George Miller, Joe Dante, John Carpenter, Baz Luhrmann, Robert Rodriguez, Edgar Wright, Quentin Tarantino, who has managed to reference and pay homage to Leone in basically all of his films, one of which, 50 years after The Good, The Bad and The Ugly was made, finally won Morricone his first Oscar. 
The influence of this scene alone cannot be overstated. The talent on display, visually and audibly, is overwhelming. It is, as Frayling put it, a virtuoso piece of filmmaking. Neither bad nor ugly, only truly good.